baptism, and perhaps the most commonplace people will turn to when we think of believer's baptism is Romans 6. However you scour the internet, there's lots of talk of Romans 6, but very few sermons. And so I'm not going to get into an exhaustive study of Romans 6. That will be months down the line. Um, But I do want us to consider all that's going to happen this morning theologically, and that this would be a, a wonderful motivator to us who do know Christ to live holy, upright lives that are beyond reproach in light of the mercies that God has shown us in the Lord Jesus Christ. But also that if you have come here this morning and Jesus Christ is not your Lord, that you will see salvation is for sinners, not just like me or Julian, but for sinners like you, and that we're saved by God's grace in Christ through faith. Well, if you've found Romans chapter 6, please stand for the reading of God's Word. I'm going to read the first 14 verses. My guess is that we may not get to the end of verse 14 this morning. Hear now God's Word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For the one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Rather, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no reign over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us a Savior. As we're going to see this morning, we desperately needed a Savior. Born into this world, in Adam, dead in sin, reigned over by the law and death and sin, Helpless, hopeless, Christless. But we're thankful that you are the God of all grace. And in your faithfulness, you sent us this promised seed, the one who would crush the head of the serpent, the one who would, who would wreck the rule of sin, the one who would usher in eternal life. Holy Spirit, would you help us this morning? Would you, would you pour out the love of God into our hearts? that as we celebrate what you have done in Julian's life, Lord, that we would also celebrate what you have done for sinners across the globe. And would you help us as we were called to worship this morning from Psalm 47, clap our hands, that we would sing your praises, that we would exalt the worthy name of Jesus Christ, this one who came into the world to save sinners. Lord, we love you. Now help us as we think through your word. Paul keeps saying, we know, we know, we know. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate now the very scriptures that you have inspired, even through Paul this morning, 
Would you give us assurance? Would you give us certainty? Lord, we cannot know these things apart from your ministry, Holy Spirit. Only you can give life to the dead. Only you, Lord, can make plain the scriptures. Only you can give us faith in Christ. Only you can give us certainty that this word is not the word of a mere pastor, but this word has been given by God for us today. Lord, save this morning. Oh, that we might see in the, in the beauty of baptism your desire to seek and to save the lost, to cleanse them and to give them hope into the age of ages, we pray. Father, do this for the glory of your Son, to the praise of the glory of your grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Well, this is a very simple sermon. It's not a simple passage if you were to study it through. It's actually quite complicated, but we'll save the complexity for months to come. And the, the three points that I want to sort of take away would all fall under the, the wonderful champion call of the Reformation. That as the gospel was retrieved, the gospel, say, in the book of Romans, we would say that sinners are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Well, I have three points, and it's simply this. Baptism reminds us that salvation is by grace alone. Second, baptism reminds us that salvation is in Christ alone. And thirdly, baptism reminds us that salvation is by or through faith alone. Well, let's get into it because it's already 1120 and we have lots to do this morning. But Romans 6 has been entitled by Thomas Schreiner as the triumph of grace over the power of sin. That's what Paul's trying to get at. If you're maybe new to this kind of teaching, if maybe you're, you're here this morning and you're unaware of, of Paul's language and his complexity or, or even things like gospel and sin reigning, if, if some of this is new to you, you might put over chapter 6 this banner is that grace triumphs over sin's power. And we're going to see that grace triumphs in Christ. And as we celebrate what grace has done in Julian's life, we see that grace has triumphed over Julian's sin. And I would put before you that grace is able to triumph over your sin as well. Firstly, baptism reminds us that salvation is all of grace. Now, this is not found in chapter 6. It's actually found in the last two verses of chapter 5. You'll notice that chapter 6 begins with the word then, or you could translate it therefore. Paul's very logical. Right? When he says in Romans 12 that, that, that giving our bodies up, presenting them to God is our logical or reasonable worship, that we're just not a bunch of people who go around with, with our heads cut off and just waving our hands and, and singing gibberish. No, we're supposed to be a logical people. And as we think through the gospel, the gospel logic, it should move our hearts to worship. Well, what's the logic here? Therefore, well, the therefore says we need to go back a little bit. Look in verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. And so what Paul's arguing in Romans 5 is the helplessness of humanity. See, in Rome, there were some Jewish people who were saying, if you say that the law is unhelpful for salvation, people will begin to live lawless lives. And Paul is going to show us, no, nothing could be further from the truth. When you understand you're saved by grace, it produces holiness and righteousness. True holiness and true righteousness. And so Paul is trying to show us here how helpless we are and not even God's holy law can save us. That's in Romans 7 as well. The law is good. It's holy and righteous and true. But the law is not the power of God for salvation to those who believe. That's the gospel's work. The law reveals to us that we are lost, condemned sinners in Adam, but the law points us to Christ even as we saw in John chapter 5. Your hope this morning is not trying harder. Your hope is not saying, well, I broke eight out of ten laws. Hopefully I can keep two or maybe I can make some up or maybe God can give me some other way. No, the law condemns you. Your only hope this morning is in God's grace in Christ through faith. One trespass, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. You can read that this afternoon, but something happened there that changed the course of history where the first Adam, 
who was made in the image of God and was to, to bring God's will and God's rule and his reign to the ends of the earth through his obedience, he failed. You might say it was not only a cataclysmic failure, it was a cosmic failure. Because what Paul teaches here is that Adam's sin didn't just affect him. It affected us all. There's a, a nice little Dutch rhyming scheme I learned from Nathan's dad when I first moved here. In Adam's fall, we sin it all. Paul's teaching here of the hopelessness of humanity under the law of God. Paul is saying to these Jews, if you put your hope in law, you're in big trouble. Why? Because even Adam was a lawbreaker. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for Adam, no, what does it say in verse 18? It led to condemnation for all men, for all people. But here's the grace. So one act of righteousness, what is that? He's comparing and contrasting Adam's one cosmic sin in the garden. And he's contrasting that with the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. One act or the supreme act of his obedience on the cross. Notice, we have an inclusio. Disobedience in regards to a tree and obedience in regards to a tree. Through the one man's sin, through the tree, it brought condemnation for all those who belong to him. But through the obedience of the other man, the second Adam, in regards to a tree, it brings life and justification for all who belong to him. Which causes me to pause and to say, to which Adam do you belong this morning? Because if you belong only to the first Adam, by which we naturally are born into this world, all people are born in Adam, Paul says here. You don't get a choice. And you said, no, I wasn't, I wasn't born of Adam. My dad's name is Ryan. Yeah, but if you trace it all the way back, we all go back to Adam. And you might not think this is fair, but Paul wants us to end with grace abounding. If, if you think that condemnation in Adam is unfair, your mind should be blown that righteousness in Christ is even more unfair because Christ owed us nothing. Here we were, lost and ruined sinners, hopeless, helpless, hell-bound sinners, and the son says, here I am to do your will. And I will be obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. This is the, the one. Now, Jesus' entire life is categorized by obedience. But this is the chief, supreme zenith. This is the culmination of his obedient life. And it's on the cross. And it leads to righteousness. As we're going to see in Romans next week and through the, the study of Romans for the next couple of years, this is all about God's righteousness. You need righteousness. If you don't have righteousness before God, you're condemned. But righteousness comes through grace, and that's my first point. Salvation is all of grace. Here's humanity in a state with the verdict of condemnation. All men, not just people in Canada, not just, you know, Christian countries, all people. This is why we send missionaries. This is why we read Psalm 47, and we say that God reigns over the world. Even as Nathan said in Sunday school this morning, Pastor Nathan said, there's no other way. There's no other way because all people are condemned. And if works can't save you and only Christ can, we must preach Christ to the nations. There's no other option. Verse 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. If you're not in Christ this morning, th this is the banner that hangs over you. Sinner. Now, we don't like that word. But hopefully that word makes you so uncomfortable that you prize and esteem the word grace and the Lord Jesus Christ. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteousness. Verse 20. Right, here's Paul poking at these Jewish people who are championing the law, not only for righteousness, but the law for holiness. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. See, this is the grace of law. And it's the old illustration I use a hundred times, and I'm not creative enough, but if you're speeding, whether there's a sign there or not, if you're speeding, you're guilty, right? If I'm late for church and I'm flying down 25 and I'm doing 130 and I don't see the sign that says 100, I tell the police, I didn't see the sign, you're guilty. 
But if I see the sign that says 100, I'm like, whoa, that's the grace of law. It reveals. The law doesn't, doesn't make me innocent. The, the law reveals God's standard, and it reveals I'm speeding. The sign doesn't pay for my ticket. I'm not putting my hope in a sign. And that's what the law does. It, it came to reveal. We're going to see that in chapter 7 later. Right? Paul thought he was good. And then the law came to life and it killed him. It showed Paul and it shows me and it declares to you and all of humanity. No one gets out of this. We're all lawbreakers. But this is my point. But where sin increased, if you have your Bible open, what does it say right after that? Grace. Grace superabounded, you might translate that. It hyper, literally, it hyperabounded all the more. Salvation is by grace. Condemnation is by law. Condemnation is by nature. Condemnation is for all. But where the law increased, grace puts it to shame. And grace superbounded way over it. You might think the law is, is high and hanging over you. But in Christ, God reveals that grace triumphs. In Christ, God reminds us, grace avails for all who will receive it. Grace abounds. It's not just a little sprinkling. So I would ask you this morning, have you been saved by God's grace? Or does the law still hang heavy upon you? Does the law condemn you as a lawbreaker, as a sinner, as a trespasser, as a rebel under God's wrath? If you would say, that's me, then may this ring in your ears and may it draw you to Christ. There is grace for you and it abounds. It's not just for a little bit for Julian here. And last week we celebrated the baptisms in Tabor. God has enough grace for you, sinner, this morning. What's the result? So that as... Sin reigned in death. Grace might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Baptism reminds us, firstly, that salvation is all of grace. If you are to be saved this morning, you cannot earn it. You cannot buy it or purchase it. You cannot try hard enough. If there is a, a guilty, condemned sinner before a holy judge, he cannot earn out of his judgment. That judgment, that sentence must be paid. And what the gospel says is that by God's grace, that sentence has been paid. Jesus Christ, we saw in Sunday school of Isaiah 53, became that guilt offering. He became that sin offering. He paid the debt. Right, so I'm, I'm late to church. It's hard for you to fathom that, of course. But I get caught by the police officer he gives me my ticket, and it's just. I'm condemned. That ticket, whether I see it or not, it's still there, and, the, and I have to stand before a judge. I can't pay it. Right? Baptist pastors don't make enough to pay for speeding tickets. And so I'm standing before the judge, and I'm like, I, I don't have the funds necessary. And it would be just for him to say, well, then there has to be some other form of payment. And just as about he's about to hammer the gavel down on that wood block, someone says, well, I have payment for Ryan. Actually, I have more. I have superabounding payment. That's grace. If Lazar says, I, I have the money, that poor pastor doesn't make enough, I've, I've, got, I've got more than enough for him, and I will pay his fine. I will absorb that, that condemnation, that ticket that he has earned by his work of sin. I will pay for it fully. And then the judge can say, paid in full. Ryan is no longer condemned. Ryan is no longer guilty. That's a picture of the gospel. Right? But if I'm saying, well, you know, judge, I can do a lot of push-ups or maybe I can do you. No, you can't pay for it, Ryan. And so if you are to be saved, it is only by God's grace. And it abounds in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ who came into the world to be that sin offering. Look at Romans chapter 8. You can turn in your Bibles quickly. Right before Paul says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Why? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. It has justified you in Christ from the law of sin and death. 
for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. You, if, if you are to be declared justified this morning, if you are to be declared innocent this morning, it will not be because you're a good person and you tried harder starting now. It's not because you turn a new leaf over on January the 1st. The only way that you can ever be saved, justified, declared righteous, forgiven, is by God's grace as you receive it through faith in Christ. Do you see that? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh. And that's what the baptism waters remind us, that Christ came into the world to become that sin offering, that, that payment for sin. The wages of sin is, is death. So Jesus dies for our sin. We heap our sin on Jesus. He dies in our place. The wrath of God is satisfied. Grace is a major theme in this section. And if you're looking for something to do this afternoon, read Romans 5 and just highlight grace. Grace reigns. Grace abounds. Grace is glorious. Salvation is by grace alone. Second, salvation is in Christ alone. This is this wonderful doctrine of union with Christ. And we'll unpack it. But I just want to read verses 1 through 4. It's verses 1 through 11. But, but if we are to be saved, it's by God's grace, but it's in Christ. See if you can see that. Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul says, may it never be. Perish the thought, or as the ESV translates, by no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? And you're thinking, like, what in the world? How did I die to sin? If you're a Christian here this morning, you died to sin when Christ died to sin. How does that work? This is what we call the doctrine of union with or union in Christ. His death to sin becomes your death to sin if you're in him. Okay, this is this doctrine. Just as Adam's sin is given to you if you belong to him, so Christ's righteousness is given to you if you belong to him. It's very easy. This is what we call federal headship. So some of us here may or may not love our prime minister. It's not my place to say where I am. But if he makes a really foolish decision, which he's known to do, but if he, say, declares war on the United States, he is the head of our country, right? And, and, and what he does has consequences for all those who belong to him. You might say we're united to our head. As goes the head, so goes the body. And so what Paul is saying here is if you are in Christ, who is your representative, your covenant, your federal head, as goes him, so goes you. And we know what happened on the cross. Christ died. But what Paul's saying here is that on the cross, Christ died not only for sin, but to sin. This is our only hope, not only of salvation, this is our only hope of holiness. So as Christ is on the cross... What Paul is saying is that for all who belong to him, go back 2,000 years ago, and as it were, your sins are nailed to that cross. That's in Colossians chapter 2. Your sins are heaped on him because you're in Christ. Do you see that? Verse 3, do you not know? See, we need to know things, which is why we're going to study Romans. Do you not know that all of us, all of us, who's the us? Those who are faith believers, those who are in Christ, you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? What in the world is happening here? It, it, you know, when we baptize Julian, is this somehow going to baptize him into this? No, no, no. For Paul, th there's this picture of salvation, and he's, he's saying that baptism is a picture of all that transpires. Water baptism pictures salvation. It pictures that Julian put his faith in Christ. It pictures that Julian died with Christ to sin. And it pictures that Julian was raised with Christ to newness of life. And it's all symbolized by baptism. I have fancy commentators, and you can read them, but you're not saved by baptism. However, if you are saved, you ought to be baptized because baptism is, is sort of the final act of the, the, the conversion or salvation experience. You're saved by faith, Julian. But that faith is demonstrated publicly and obediently in, in immersion or in baptism. So Paul's not saying, you know, well, I believed in Jesus, but I haven't baptized. No, if you believe in Jesus, you're in Jesus. And then baptism declares that publicly. And so that's what he's saying here. We were buried, therefore, 
And so what we're going to say when we baptize Julian is he's going to say, Julian is in Christ. Christ's death to sin has become Julian's death to sin. Christ's resurrection to righteousness and life has become Julian's righteousness and resurrection to life. There's no salvation from God outside of Christ. Some of you maybe heard of a man named John Calvin. I love what he has to write. And he says, all that Christ is and all that Christ has done means nothing to us if we're outside of him. Like I got this rocking guitar amp and it's got all kinds of effects, but if it's not plugged into the power source, it's useless. All of those benefits. Right? You, have a, you have the fanciest car, but if, if your key's not in the ignition, the car's useless. All that Christ is, all that he's done for lost, ruined, helpless, hell-bound sinners means nothing to you if you're not in him by faith. Salvation is, yes, by grace alone, but it's in Christ alone because he alone has become that sin offering that the Father receives. You can put your hope in all kinds of other things. They will not be received by the Father. You can become more religious. You can become a Muslim or Hindu, Jehovah's Witness, Catholic. You can become a smart atheist. You can work, 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 be a good, moral, tax-paying family man. But if you're not in Christ, you have no forgiveness. You're still a condemned moral man. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. How was Julian saved? He was saved by grace alone, in Christ alone. Thirdly, he was saved through faith alone. That's verses 12 through 14. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, to make you obey its passions. See, Paul's using, he's not teaching about baptism for baptism's sake. He's teaching about baptism to spur on, to encourage those who are in Christ to live holy lives, consistent lives. Not only did Christ die for your sins, he also rose again for your obedience. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. Rather, present yourselves to God. That's the same idea as Romans 12, right? Presenting yourselves as a living sacrifice. And you can't give God a living sacrifice unless you're in the living Christ. Do you see that? If you're outside of Christ, your sacrifice is dead, reeking, rotting, stinking. Those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under law but under grace. And you're like, well, where's faith there? Well, this is where I'm going to be a little bit sneaky. So this is chapter 5. Go back to chapter 4 for a second. Look at chapter 4, verse 16. Because this is sort of like a lock and key, right? Grace requires faith, and faith requires grace. They're two sides of the same coin. They're not identical, but they operate together, Okay? So Paul's talking about how Abraham, the father of us all, the father of Jews and of Gentiles, the father of those who have faith, not the father of, of, of those who are merely ethnically, you know, Israelites, but those who have faith, okay? And, and God made a promise by grace, and Abraham received that grace through faith. You see that in verse 16. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace. You see how that works? It is that you're saved by grace, but that grace is appropriated through faith, and this faith is in the promise, and that promise is in the gospel. That's the whole thesis of Romans. If you were to go back and study 1, 16 and 17, Paul wants to get to Rome because he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to all who have faith, or all who believe, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is being revealed from faith to faith, or you might translate beginning and ending in faith. How is a Jew reconciled to a holy God? Through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. How is a Gentile reckoned right before God? Through faith in Christ via the gospel. And this is all God reigning through grace. Grace. 
The gospel is the power of God for salvation. Some of you have maybe heard of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, but it says this. In justification, God pardons sin through faith. In sanctification, God subdues sin through faith. So, so, so how are you saved from first to last? Through faith in Christ. You're justified by faith, and Paul says now you're sanctified by faith. That's his argument. And so as you begin, Julian, you don't just believe, get justified, and then go on living for yourself. No. Salvation from first to last, beginning to end, Alpha to Omega, is through faith. Your holiness is the result of faith. Holiness and godliness is the fruit of faith. And so if we want to see you saved here this morning, baptism pictures for you three things. This is a short sermon. But if you are to be saved, you're saved by grace, through faith, in Christ, to the glory of God the Father. Let's close in prayer. We'll have Julian come and share his testimony. We'll baptize him and then stick around um, for after that. We're going to sing a song and then lay hands on Pastor Matt. Uh, he was voted in last week at our members meeting and he's becoming our third elder, our, our third pastor here. So that's why the service is a little bit shortened. I don't want to keep you too long. But I do hope that Romans 6 reminds you of baptism and that baptism is a picture of what God has done for us in Christ. That God is one who reigns by and through grace in Christ by faith. And I would ask you here this morning, have you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? To which Adam do you belong? If you belong to the first Adam, who is the father of us all, the Bible says you're condemned. But if by God's grace you've been brought to the realization that you cannot save yourself, that the law only increases your guilt before God, if you've come to that realization and also know that God loved the world and he gave his son as the second Adam to live that righteous life and to become that sin atoning sacrifice, if you believe that, Paul says in Romans 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Right? For with the mouth you believe and are justified. Right? And with the heart, you believe that Christ is raised. If you believe that, the Bible says that you have been saved by God's grace through faith in Christ. And the Bible would say that you should therefore be baptized. When, when we're baptizing Julian, what are we doing? We're demonstrating publicly and outwardly something that has happened inwardly and spiritually. These waters do not save. Perhaps you, you, you're new to the, to the Christian uh, message of the gospel, and you're like, oh, you know, Julian must be doing something in the water, or there's maybe, you know, I poured in some magic potion, or, you know, my, my pastoral finger sanctified the water. No, 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 no. It's just water. All that is is just water. It's regular Diamond City water. Nothing special about it. But it's a picture of cleansing and of washing. And Julian has been washed inwardly, says Titus 3, by the washing of regeneration, this renewal of the Holy Spirit. And that God has cleansed Julian's heart through faith, faith in Christ. But it also signifies that, that, that Julian goes into the water and it's this, sort of this picture of like a transformation. Back in the day, there used to be little things, they'd be one color and you put them in water and you pull them out and they're a new color. Not the best analogy, but Julian, as it were, goes in, right? Pre-Christ, he's a sinner who is condemned. Post-Christ or faith in Christ, he comes up clean and washed before God Almighty. And that's what baptism is to signify, right? Just imagine Julian had some special dye on and it was all black and he goes into the water, we baptize him, right? He's dyed to that sin, he comes up new and it's white. That would be ideal, I don't know if there's such a thing, but it's all it is doing is symbolizing, picturing for us what the gospel does to sinners, what God's grace can do for us in Christ if we would but believe this good news. Okay, so he's dying, the old Julian Condemned Julian, dead. Justified Julian, alive. And you don't need to be a certain age. You don't need to be at least 10 years old. There's no limit. Perhaps you're a young person here this morning. Perhaps you're old. Perhaps you're in between. The gospel is for you. God's grace superabounds in Christ, and it's offered freely. Would you but receive it?
by faith. Would you hear this good news and respond and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that God's grace might abound in your life as well. Well, let me close. We'll have Julian come up and read his testimony, but let's pray first. Father, we so thank you that where sin did abound, where it did increase, grace superabounded. It super increased. It multiplied exponentially more glorious and high in our estimation. And so, Father, we thank you for your wisdom. Who has known the mind of the Lord? and Who has been his counselor? Who, who has given him a gift that he should be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And we would say to you, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, to you alone be the glory. As we celebrate your saving reign in Julian's life, as we, as we baptize him, we remind ourselves that with Julian, we who are believers are no longer slaves to sin. That, that sin no longer reigns over us. And though it remains, it no longer is that slavish taskmaster. It no longer forces us. And Father, I pray that you would help us to remember, as Christians especially, that your grace is ruling over us and obedience is possible. Would you help us to know and to remember, to reflect on the mercies of God afresh in Christ? And would you help us as Christians, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, or as we read this morning, to present our members as instruments for righteousness. That we're not trying harder, we're just worshiping better. That we're living this new life that Christ has earned for us. This new life we have in him is now being lived out in this world. Lord, would you help us to live in such a way that others see our good works and give glory to you, Father, the one who sent the son of John 5. And Holy Spirit, would you be powerfully working, wooing, drawing irresistibly sinners to Christ, opening up blind eyes, unstopping dead ears, cleansing hearts through faith. Lord, be glorified now even as our brother in Christ. Julian shares his testimony and be glorified, Lord, even as we are obedient to the faith in baptizing him, immersing him publicly in the triune name of God. Lord, we love you. We can't thank you enough for the Lord Jesus Christ. Receive our praise and be glorified, not just now, but be glorified for the end of days, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.